My name, Arnold Gregston, interviewed in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm 97 years old. Most of the slaves don't know when they was born, but I did. You see, I was born on a Christmas morning. It was in 1840. I was a full-grown man when I finally got my freedom. Before I got it, though, I helped a lot of others get theirs. Lord only knows how many. Might have been as many of two, three hundred. It was way more than a hundred, I know, but that all came after I was a young man, grown, enough to know a pretty girl when I saw one and to go chasing after her, too. I was born on a plantation that belonged to Mr. Jack Tabb in Mason County, just across the river in Kentucky. Mr. Tabb was a pretty good man. He used to be to sure, but not nearly as much as, as others did, some of his own kin people even. But he was kind of funny sometimes. He used to have a special slave who didn't have nothing to do but teach the rest of us. We had about ten on the plantation and a lot on the other plantations near us. How to read and write and figure. Mr. Tab liked us to know how to figure. But sometimes when he would send for us and we would be a long time coming, he would ask us where we had been. If we told him we had been learning to read, he was near beat the daylights out of us after getting somebody to teach us. I think he did some of that so that the other owners wouldn't say he was spoiling his slaves. He was funny about us marrying, too. He would let us go according on the other plantations near any time we liked if we were good. And if we found somebody we wanted to marry and she was on a plantation that belonged to one of his kinfolks or to a friend, he would swap a slave so that the husband and wife could be together. Sometimes, when he couldn't do this, he would let a slave work all day on his plantation and live with his wife at night on her plantation. Some of the other owners was always talking about his spoiling us. He wasn't a Democrat like the rest of them in the county. He belonged to the Know Nothing Party, and he was a real leader in it. He used to always be making speeches, and sometimes his best friends wouldn't be speaking to him for days at a time. Mr. Tab was always especially good to me. He used to let me go all about. I guess he had to. Couldn't get too much work out of me even when he kept me right under his eyes. I learned fast, too, and I think he kind of liked that. He used to call Sandy Davis, a slave who taught me, the smartest nigger in Kentucky. It was cause he used to let me go around in the day and night so much that I came to be the one who carried the running away slaves over the river. It was funny the way I started it. I didn't have no idea of ever getting mixed up in any sort of business like that until one special night. I hadn't even thought of rowing across the river myself, but one night I was gone on another plantation courting, and the old woman whose house I went to told me she had a real pretty girl there who wanted to go across the river, and would I take her? I was scared and backed out in a hurry, but then I saw the girl, and she was such a pretty little thing, brown-skinned and kind of rosy, and looked as scared as I was feeling. So it wasn't long before I was listening to the old woman tell me when to take her and where to leave her on the other side. I didn't have nerve enough to do it that night, though, and I told them to wait for me till tomorrow night. All the next day I kept seeing Mr. Tab laying a rawhide across my back and shooting me and kept seeing that scared little brown girl back at the house looking at me with their big eyes and asking me if I wouldn't row her across to Ripley, Ohio. Me and Mr. Tab lost and soon as dust settled that night I was at the old lady's house. I don't know how I ever rode that boat across the river. The current was strong and I was trembling. 
I couldn't see a thing there in the dark, but I felt that girl's eyes. We didn't dare to whisper, so I couldn't tell her how sure I was that Mr. Tab or some of the other owners would tear me up when they found out what I had done. I just knew they would find out. I was worried, too, about where to put her out of the boat. I couldn't ride her across the river all night, and I didn't know a thing about the other side. I had heard a lot about it from other slaves, but I thought was just about like Mason County, with slaves and masters, overseers, and rawhides, so I just knew that if I pulled the boat up and went to asking people where to take her, I would get a beating or get killed. I don't know whether it seemed like a long time or a short time now. It was long ago. I knew it was a long time rowing there in the cold and worrying, but it was short too. Because as soon as I did get on the other side, the big-eyed, brown-skinned girl would be gone. Well, pretty soon I saw a tall light, and I remembered that the old lady had told me about looking for that light and rowing to it. I did, and when I got to it, two men reached down and grabbed her. I started trembling all over again and praying. Then one of the men took my arm, and I just felt down inside of me that the Lord had got ready for me. You hungry, boy, is what he asked me, and if he hadn't been holding me, I think I would have fell backwards into the river. Well, that was my first trip. It took me a long time to get over my scared feeling, but I finally did, and I soon found myself going back across the river with two or three people, and sometimes a whole boatload. I got so I used to make three or four trips a month. What did my passage look like? I can't tell you any more about it than you can, and you wasn't there. After the first girl, no, I never did see her again. I never saw my passengers. It would have to be the black nights of the moon when I could carry them, and I could would meet them out in the open or in a house without a single light. The only way I knew who they were was to ask them, What you say? And they would answer, Maneri. I don't know what that word meant, it come from the Bible. I only know that that was the password I used, and all of them that I took over told it to me before I took them. I guess you wonder what I did with them after I got them over the river. Well, there in Ripley was a man named Mr. Rankins. I think the rest of his name was John. He had a regular station there on his place for escaping slaves. You see, Ohio was a free state, and once they got over the river from Kentucky or Virginia, Mr. Rankins would strut them all around town, and nobody would bother. The only reason we used to land them quietly at night was so that whoever brought them could get back for more. And because we had to be careful that none of the owners had followed us. Every once in a while they would follow a boat and catch their slaves back. Sometimes they would shoot at whoever was trying to save the poor devils. Mr. Rankins had a regular station for the slaves. He had a big lighthouse in his yard about 30 feet high. And he kept it burning all night. It always meant freedom for a slave if he could get to this light. Sometimes Mr. Rankins would have 20 or 30 slaves that had run away on his place at a time. It must have cost him a whole lot to keep them fit, but I think some of his friends helped. Those who wanted to stay around that part of Ohio could stay, but didn't many of them do it because there was too much danger that you would be walking along free one night, feel a hand over your mouth, and be back across the river and in slavery again in the morning. And nobody in the world ever got a chance to know how much misery as a slave that had escaped and been caught. So a whole lot of them went on north to other parts of Ohio or to New York, Chicago, or Canada. 
Canada was popular then because all of the slaves thought it was the last gate before you get all the way inside of heaven. I don't think there was much chance for a slave to make a living in Canada, but didn't many of them come back? It seemed like they rather starve up there in the cold than be back in slavery. The army soon started taking a lot of them too. They could enlist in the Union Army and get good wages, more food than they ever had, and had all the little gals waving at them when they passed. Them blue uniforms was a nice change too. I never got anything from a single one of the people I carried over the river to freedom. I didn't want anything. After I had made a few trips, I got to like it, and even though I could have been free any night myself, I figured I wasn't getting along so bad, so I would stay with Mr. Tab's place and help the others get free. I did it for four years. I don't know to this day how he never knew what I was doing. I used to take some awful chances, and he knew I must have been up to something. I wouldn't do much work in the day would never be in my house at night, and when he would happen to visit the plantation where I was said I was going, I wouldn't be there. Sometimes I think he did know and wanted me to get the slaves away that way so he wouldn't have to cause hard feelings by freeing them. I think Mr. Tabb used to talk a lot to Mr. John Fee. Mr. Fee was a man who lived in Kentucky, but Lord, how that man hated slavery. He used to always tell us, we never let our owners see us listening to him, though, that God didn't intend for some men to be free and some men to be in slavery. He used to talk to the owners, too, when they listened to him, but mostly they hated the sight of John Fee. In the night, though, he was a different man. For every slave who came through his place going across the river, he had a good word, something to eat, and some kind of rags, too, if it was cold. He always knew just what to tell you to do if anything went wrong, and sometimes I think he kept slaves there on his place till they could be rowed across the river. Helped us a lot. I almost ran the business in the ground after I'd been carrying slaves across for nearly four years. It was in 1863, and one night I carried across about 12 on the same night. Somebody must have seen us, because they set out after me as soon as I stepped out of the boat back in Kentucky side. From that time on, they were after me. Sometimes they would almost catch me. I had to run away from Mr. Tab's plantation and live in the fields and in the woods. I didn't know what a bed was from one week to another. I would sleep in a cornfield tonight, up in the branches of a tree tomorrow night, and buried in a hay pile the next night. The river where I had carried so many across myself was no good to me. It was watched too close. Finally, I saw that I could never do any more good in Mason County, so I decided to take my freedom, too. I had a wife by this time, and one night we quietly slipped across and headed for Mr. Rankin's bell and light. It looked like we had to go almost to China to get across that river. I could hear the bell and see the light on Mr. Rankin's place, but the harder I rode, the farther away it got and I knew if I didn't make it, I'd get killed. But finally, I pulled up to the lighthouse and and went on to my freedom, just a few months before all the slaves got theirs. I didn't stay in Ripley, though. I wasn't taking no chances. I went on to Detroit and still lived there with my most of my 10 children and 31 grandchildren. The bigger ones don't care so much about hearing it now. But the little ones never get tired of hearing how they grandpa brought emancipation to loads of slaves he could touch and feel, but never could see.